What a difference a definition can make. And what does religion have to do with hardcore pornography? I'm Dr. Richard Newton, and this is your introduction to the study of religion. And it's coming up right now. The academic study of religion is first and foremost anthropological. Now that doesn't mean you need to take an anthropology class to learn about religion. You're good right where you are. You couldn't be in a better place. But as scholar of religion Willie Braun tells us, religious studies is anthropocentric. Its object of study, first and foremost, is human beings. When we study religion in this class, we're interested in two things. First, we're interested in what human beings do with and around this thing we're calling religion. Secondly, we're looking at what this thing called religion tells us about how human beings work. When we're engaged in this two-part process, we are involved in something called deconstruction. Deconstruction doesn't mean that we're out here to destroy religion. We're not blowing religion up. But what we're doing is we're getting under the hood. We're looking at religion's pieces, its components, its processes. We're looking to see how religion works. Think about it like an engineer or a mechanic who sometimes takes apart the thing they're working on so they can better understand it and make sense of it. If we're going to engage in the academic study of religion, we would do well to define our terms. First and foremost, starting with religion. What is religion? What do we mean by religion? What does that term bring up to you? Is it baggage? Is it politics? Maybe it's beliefs and hope. Maybe it's a value system. Maybe it's rituals and traditions and certain practices. Rudolf Otto, an early 20th century philosopher and theologian, wrote a book called The Idea of the Holy, where he argued that what unites all religions across time and space is this notion of the holy, this notion of the supernatural that is beyond us and what we can put into words. Now, the problem with that, as scholars of religion have since found, is that there are plenty of people who do something that gets classified as religion in one context or another, but really have no interest in the supernatural or the holy. Buddhists, for one, oftentimes would say that the supernatural is really an illusion. And what do we make of the fact that a lot of people here at our own campus would see football as their religion? Now, there's certainly a lot of praying that happens at a football game, but would we really think about football as holy? Maybe some people do, maybe some people don't. What we need to keep in mind as scholars of religion engaged in this anthropocentric enterprise is that we have to be very precise with our terms. And to help us deconstruct what religion is and all the things that religion is meant to be, we are going to chart a sort of genealogy of the term, looking at the ways that the term has changed over history and has meant different things in different places. As we do that, we're going to see that we really need to make sure that we don't import ideas from one people group to another, which we call ethnocentrism. We need to make sure that we don't hold one tradition, especially Christianity, which is so prevalent in the United States, as the standard for other traditions to meet. That's called Christocentrism. And we also need to make sure that we're not anachronistic. That is, importing an understanding of religion from one time onto another time. For this next part, we're going to create a genealogy of religion. A genealogy is a model that helps us understand how a single notion or topic has changed over time. So we're going to look at how the term religion has changed over time, and we'll also look at a, different, a couple of different places where we see the term religions being used so we can get a better sense of the varieties of meanings that are ascribed to the term. So what I want you to do is pull out your notes and you're going to create a chart that looks like the one that's on your screen. And I want you to press pause, record what you see me writing, and then after you read um, the textbook and also watch these videos, you can um, study this chart alongside of it and I think it'll help you uh, make sense of what's going on with these terms and have a more precise understanding of the way that definition works and the problem that it can pose for different parties. So to begin with, we're going to look at the 4th century BCE to the 4th century CE, um, focusing particularly on Greece and Rome. Now these times that I'm, I'm noting, they're rough times, okay? They're rough uh, bracketings of historical moments, so keep that in mind. But 4th century BCE to 4th century CE is where we're going to begin our look at the term religion. 
And what we find is that the term religion as we understand it in English doesn't quite appear. We get something along the lines of religio or religiones for plural, you'll see. Um, and religio has something to do with custom. It means something like custom, scruples, which is an old term that we don't really use much anymore. Superstition is actually another translation for this. Um, and superstition, I should say, doesn't mean what we mean by it today. It doesn't mean like, don't walk underneath a ladder or you'll get bad luck. It means doing something and being very, super, being very, very careful about the acts that you do because they have consequences. So you can see where we get the sort of negative valence of superstition. But superstition in this time and place means something like, what are the customs that you do in order to make sure that life goes on the way it's supposed to go on? What are the rituals that we do in order to make sure that traditions and a sense of normalcy is provided? So you can think of the kind of customs you have in an event like a baseball game, where everyone stands up and says the Pledge of Allegiance at a certain point, you do the seventh inning stretch, right? There's all these customs that we do so that we feel like we're at a baseball game. What are the customs that we do so we feel like life can go on? That is what religio or religiones are in the fourth century BCE to fourth century CE in Greece and Rome. I should also note that there's this other term, um, religere, which means something like to bind. Religare or religare, I guess religare is probably the better way of saying it. Religare means to bind. It's, an, it's a verb, uh, it's where we get our term ligament from. And a lot of people over time have thought about the idea of religare as a way to think about religion. Um, it's unclear whether religare, religare was ever part of the etymology or word history of our term religion. Uh, we think maybe it just sounded like it, but the metaphor works well, right? What are the things that we do to bind our society together so we have a sense of normalcy? But the etymology or word history for religion seems to come from this term religio, which means custom or superstition, scruple, something along those lines. Just by way of point of comparison, in the 7th century in Arabia, we see the term din. This is an Arabic term. It gets used in the Quran. It also means custom. So when the term religion appears in English translations of the Quran, the word is usually translating the Arabic term din, which means customs. What are the customs that you do in order to be a part of the world and to make sense of it and fit in? This all probably seems pretty well and good, but we should also note that in times that's closer to our own, like the 16th century in Europe, we get to see that religion, as it appears in our own English language, means something a little different than both what we see in the 4th century and also what we see in our own time today. In 16th century Europe, what becomes of extreme importance is the distinction between Catholic and Protestant, right? Um, these are key terms to understanding religion in the 16th century, particularly in Europe. And so this distinction between Catholic and Protestant becomes important because for Catholics, it seems to mean the way the world works, right? Catholic even means the whole universe, um, the whole world. For Protestants, religion becomes something having to do with the individual. And of course, Martin Luther is a key reformer of the Catholic Church who helps change what purview the church has. And that is, the church has a purview in terms of God. And it's important, though, that individuals understand that their relationship with God is really between them and their maker. So the Catholic Church as an institution, yes, can rule lands and whatever, kingdoms and the like, but it's individuals who have their relationship with God, and that's the site of religion. That's the key here. It's also worth noting that Martin Luther was Catholic himself. A lot of times people think of Martin Luther as this guy who just came along and was like, forget the Catholic Church. No, he was reforming the Catholic Church, making clear where the bounds of the Catholic Church as an institution stopped and where the um, experience that is religion starts, begins, and, and happens. And for him, he believes that religion happens between the individual and God. So that's why I make this distinction between the sort of whole world and individual. Um, and Martin Luther is a key figure in that. Similarly, in the 17th and 18th century in Europe, we see a distinction between um, true and false religion. 
true and false religion. Now, these are key terms because what happens is this guy named John Locke, you've probably heard from political science, he says that true religion cannot happen by way of compulsion. He says you can only force false religion. True religion has to be of the conscious, or conscience rather. It has to be the person choosing, hence freedom of religion, right, becomes a value. The state cannot enforce religion for it to be true religion. And so John Locke is the guy who really helps us understand this distinction between true religiosity and false religiosity. And you might be like, well, these aren't quite definitions of religion, right? These are sort of places where religion um, works versus where religion isn't seen to be at work. But that's also a key part of the definition that religion has certain boundaries in which it is relevant or real or makes sense. In the 4th century BCE to 4th century CE, it's a custom. It's an all-encompassing custom. We have customs and things that we do in order to keep our sense of the world normal. 7th century Arabia, similar thing. We have din. We have customs and rites and activities that we do in order to keep the world um, the way it is. In the 16th century, we begin to see that there are certain offices that are in charge of certain parts of our existence. There is an office that rules the political system. There's an office that cannot rule what individuals do, right? There's a sense of conscience and heart and per the personal, personal space that arrives in the 16th century. And religion happens in the personal, individual, private space, not the public space that the institution is involved in. Institutions, be it the church or be it the king. 17th century, 18th century, we begin to see distinctions between where religion happens best and what accounts for good religion. And true religion happens in the conscience in that private space and cannot be forced or compelled by the state. In the 18th, 19th, and 20th century, what we begin to see is an evolutionary schema. And this schema helps at least helped people of that time and of the West, I should say, come to understand the difference between primitive and civilized people, which is not a distinction we use anymore, largely because people like anthropologist E.E. E. Evans Pritchard helped us understand that this distinction between civilized and primitive is really relative, right? What one person calls civilized might be primitive in another person's eyes. I hope that we look on the things that we've done in the past as quote unquote primitive and that we become more civilized as we develop in the future. But what E.E. E. Evans Pritchard argued was that many of the things that we count as civilized in our society have often been used to perpetrate really evil, bad things. I mean, if you think slavery is bad, if you think uh, patriarchy is bad, if you think um, child labor is bad, you name it, right? These are things that have been defended against or defended by quote unquote civilized religion, the way of being in our sense of norm in the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. So he argued that you should be really, really careful with drawing a line between primitive and civilized. I'll move my head out of the way so you can see those two words, primitive and civilized. Now, just to put a finer point on all of this, what this all means is that when we talk about the problem of definition, we need to look at who is defining the term religion and what it is they're defining. At the beginning of the episode, I mentioned that religion is something like an obscene movie. Now, I wasn't trying to be provocative here. I was actually being historical. In 1964, there was a Supreme Court case called Jacob Ellis v. Ohio. In Ohio, there was an art house movie theater that played a film called The Lovers. It was a French film, an indie film that they were showing. And the film had some steamy romantic scenes that they believed they were well in their right to show. But the surrounding township in Ohio argued that the, this film was actually pornographic. The Supreme Court had to make the decision of whether the township was correct in saying that these films were not good for public consumption or whether the movie theater had the right to show this film because it was protected under a freedom of speech. Justice Potter Stewart argued in his um, interpretation of the matters at hand that he didn't know what pornography was, and pornography is hard to define, but he knows it when he sees it. 
that I know it when I see it is kind of the mantra for deconstruction. That there's so many things that we have trouble defining, and even when we define them, we know that that definition is tentative, that it is subject to change. But we know it when we see it is the privilege that we often hold when getting to define things around us and making sense of the world. But as scholars of religion, we have to be more precise. We have to be more careful. We have to pay attention. And I want you to pay attention to three sort of ideas that sometimes scholars fall into the trap of um, making when they're observing people doing this thing called religion. And that is, first and foremost, that religion is something irrational versus the scientific things that us moderns do today. The problem with that notion, Martin argues, is that what is modern, what is contemporary, what is in the now is always subject to change. And of course, what looks normal to us seems right, but that often ends up being ethnocentric. It often ends up being anachronistic as well. And so we need to be careful with labeling something as irrational in one moment and what we tend to do as rational, correct um, of the times and the right way of doing things. Secondly, we need to be careful of this notion of religion being either organized versus the sort of unorganized spiritual track that other people do. We often hear this in public discourse as the spiritual but not religious. And while that distinction is useful for some people who are trying to define themselves, as we try to come to understand people in comparative terms, distinguishing, distinguishing between spiritual and religious doesn't really get us very far. Plenty of people who see what they're doing as religious would say that they practice spiritual disciplines. People who say they're doing things that are spiritual will call upon freedom of religion in order to protect their right to do what they do. I bring all that up to say that the distinction between spiritual but not religious, or spiritual and unorganized versus religion and the organized, really just isn't a useful distinction for us as scholars of religion to make in determining what is our proper object of study. It's something that people who are our object of study are free to do, right? They can do and live their lives how they want to do. Our job is to observe what they're doing and how they do it. Lastly, I want to make sure that we don't fall into the trap of labeling some things that are religious as primitive versus other things that are civilized. That primitive versus civilized distinction is something we're going to look at in coming chapters and coming episodes. But that gets into some ethnocentrism and Christocentrism that can come along with a lot of great baggage like colonialism, slavery, imperialism, classism, ableism, and a whole bunch of other social distinctions that define some people as less than others. And we as scholars are dispassionate from evaluating the worth of human beings. We want to understand how people evaluate the world around them.